And I know I may sound pretty deep about this, but I've been doing this for over 20 years, like going to heaven. I don't take myself, I'm taken. A purple sound day of my life but i believe in miracles because i believe in god Fire! he's being electrocuted by god's power this young man is being electrocuted today by we're talking about weirdos is it okay to be a weirdo for jesus God is calling Christians to join hands with heaven as we journey together toward the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ instructs us to pray this way, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On this show, we'll be talking about spiritual healing and deliverances, angels and demons, prophetic words, visions and dreams, unity in the body of Christ, the meaning of salvation, legalism versus freedom, and everything else to do with Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. And Blue Tap, this is Join Hands with Heaven. Welcome to the Join Hands with Heaven podcast. I'm your host, Blue Tap, and I'm coming to you from Blue Eye, Missouri, where my husband and I are homesteaders. So thank you for watching. This is podcast number four, and we're going to be talking about weirdos for Jesus. Kat Kerr, Robin Bullock, Catherine Kuhlman, uh, Benny Hinn. These are all really weird, weird people, right? They're weirdos for Jesus. Over the past couple of months, I have made two videos about Robin Bullock, and those have gotten more views than any other videos. Um, so there's obviously a lot of interest in this, this kind of topic. And so it's been very enlightening to me to see the comments, the feedback that I've gotten from these videos. Most of it's been positive. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that love uh, Robin Bullock and his wife Robin. Most of the people who have um, stood up for them, have followed them for a long time, have even met them, uh, gone to, to his school. So people that have spent a lot of time listening to him, and they are the people who seem to support him the most. Um, then there have been uh, quite a few responses, very negative, saying that he's a false prophet. But a lot of people seem to not like him simply because he looks weird. He's different. He's not normal. Um, so I'm not going to, I've already spent a lot of time talking about, about whether or not I think he's a false prophet. That's not what this video is about. So I'm not going to talk about that today. I just want to talk about just this whole, um, this whole idea of, is it okay to be a weirdo for Jesus? What are the parameters that, that if you're a Christian, that you're supposed to live within? Um, are we supposed to look a certain way or act a certain way, think a certain way. Um, so that's what I want to talk about in this podcast. So I just want to start by looking at some of the characters that we run across in the Bible. So because, you know, if you've read the Bible, um, you probably have recognized, probably have noticed there's a lot of really weird people in the Bible. So the weirdest people in the Bible are probably the prophets in the Old Testament. So I just want to, I just want to describe some of these really weird people uh, for you in case you're not familiar with, with uh, some the stories of some of these prophets. Well, even if you haven't read through the Bible, you probably have heard of this guy, Isaiah. He's pretty well known. He's many, many prophecies, including lots of prophetic words uh, about Jesus Christ many, many years, centuries before Jesus came. It's actually my favorite book in the Old Testament. I actually have um, Isaiah <laughs> tattooed on my body. So this is what I had to Pro uh, prophetic word given over me many years ago that God has uh, has shown me is true over and over again, and that was from Isaiah. Well, but Isaiah was a weird dude. God told him at one point to strip off all his clothes and wander around J Jerusalem naked and barefoot. He had to do this for three whole years. That's pretty weird. And God told him to do it. God told him to do it. So here's this very, very prestigious prophet, and he has to run around naked and barefoot 
for three years. Now, he probably was wearing something, like underwear or like a, a tunic or something, um, we think. Hopefully, hopefully he didn't have to be completely butt naked, but who knows. So Jeremiah, you may have heard of Jeremiah. He's also one of the bigger prophets. At one point, this is the weirdest. I think this one's the weirdest. At one point, God tells Jeremiah to go out and buy himself a new linen undergarment. So underwear. God says, go buy some underwear. And then he had to wear it and he could not wash it. He couldn't let water touch it. So in other words, Jeremiah had to wear dirty underwear for a very, very long time. And then finally, God lets him take off his dirty underwear. And then he was supposed to hide it in the cleft of a rock near the Euphrates. So he had to hide it. So probably dig underground, bury it under the ground and then leave it there. So then after many days, Jeremiah, God tells him to go back and dig up your dirty, messed up underwear. <laughs> and so he finds, so he does this and he finds that it is in this disgusting state and it is ruined and useless. But the weird trophy of all of the Old Testament prophets has to go to Ezekiel. So Ezekiel, I also love Ezekiel. He gives a lot of prophecies of the end times um, and um, shows these fantastic imagery of what is going on in heaven. Uh, so if you like that kind of stuff, I'll read it. It's just wonderful. Um, so anyway, he had these amazing visions, but he was mute for a time. So he couldn't even speak out the prophecies and these these amazing visions that God had given him. So instead of speaking them out, he took a clay tablet and drew these images. So that was different. And uh, then here's the weird thing. Then God instructed him to lay down on his side on the ground with the clay tablets in front of him with a iron pan, an iron pan in between him and the clay tablets. I don't know why, but that's what God told him to do. So he had to do this, lay on his side on the ground for 390 days. 390 days. That is 55 weeks, 13 months, over a year. He had to lay on his side. I don't even know how that's possible. Did he use the iron pan to go to the bathroom? I don't know. Crazy. So anyway, so after he did all that, then God told him to get up and get on his other side and lay on his other side. So anyway, that was just insane. Insane. Okay, so he had to do all of that. Like, come on, God, give me a break. Then God tells him that he has to bake his barley cakes. So this is what he eats, baking his bread, basically. Only he has to do it over cow manure. So he has to bake his bread over poop. <laughs> I, crazy, crazy, crazy. God then told him to take a sword and cut off his beard and divide all of his hair into thirds. He had to burn one, one third and then scatter another third around the city and stab it with his sword. <laughs> and then the rest, he, the, the remaining third, he threw it into the wind. <laughs> and then he had saved a few hairs and then sewed them into his clothing, which he then burned eventually. So these are just some of the weirdos in the Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament, shall we? Of course, the first really, really weirdo in the New Testament is John the Baptist. And I love, if you watch The Chosen, I love how the Peter character calls John the Baptist Creepy John. <laughs> now, obviously that's, you know, that's just a writer's uh, license. That's not anywhere in the Bible that Peter called him Creepy John, but I just think that it's so hilarious. Uh, so anyway, and he was really, really weird. So he was a was kind of a hermit character. He lived far away from, he didn't live in town with everybody else. He uh, ate bugs, locusts, and he wore uh, camel hair. John the Baptist was not normal in any way. He was a very odd character, yet he was given one of the most important uh, roles of any human being in the history of mankind to, to um, lead the way and prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Probably the weirdest guy of them all is, guess who? Jesus. So let's look at some of the ways that Jesus was weird. Everything about Jesus was radical, countercultural. Nobody was ever like him. Nobody ever will be like him. He was so, so different. He was so completely surprising and unexpected that even this entire 
this entire people group, the, the Jews, who had been looking for him and waiting for him their entire lives for generations. Most of them completely missed that the Messiah was right in front of them because he was so different than what they expected. He was so completely weird, and they weren't looking for weird. So just think about his character, everything about him. There was so much mystery about him, um, the way he came into the earth, uh, that his his father was God, <laughs> that Mary was a virgin who had a child. Jesus was gentle, yet he was powerful. He spoke the truth always, but he also told all of these strange riddles and stories in a way that a lot of people didn't really understand what he was talking about. Uh, he was a friend to children, and yet he was wildly disrespectful and confrontational to the religious leaders. In fact, the religious leaders were really the only people that he was ever rude to, that he was ever mean to. Um, he was a living example of pure holiness and virtue, and yet he hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors, and other sinners. He was usually wise and calm, and yet when he came to Jerusalem two times, he... he um, turned tables over and made everybody leave and was very violent to, to get all of the merchants out of the temple. He was a radical. He was a very, very unusual person, very weird. His teachings were incredibly radical. The kind of things that he taught, turning the other cheek, if somebody takes your coat, give him your tunic, bless those who persecute you, or love those who hate you. So these were very rad radical ideas back then. They're radical ideas even now. Then the people that he hung out with, the prostitutes and the, the sinners, sinners. Um, the woman at the well was um, a woman who had a bad reputation. And he was not only willing to speak with her when the two of them were alone, everybody else was gone. There's also the scene where he is having a, a meal at a, at a Pharisee's house and a woman who was a sinner, uh, so probably a prostitute, came and, and broke a jar of expensive perfume and doused his feet with it and, and wept over him. And he honors her and says that she is doing this amazing thing. She is preparing him for his burial. And the Pharisee, who's having house he was at thought to himself well if Jesus knew this woman was a sinner he would not let her touch him and Jesus rebuked him for that the way that, that Jesus treats people who were considered low lives and sinners was radical he loved them the way Jesus was familiar with women and was even uh, allowed them to be part of his his inner group um, and then also allowed them to even touch him and, and talk to him. Uh, that was radical. That might not be seem so radical to our culture now, but at the time it was radical. He lifted women up. So many people who aren't very familiar with Jesus' teachings and the way he acts accused Jesus and accused Christianity of being uh, very anti-woman. But Jesus was very pro-woman, radically so in his culture and in his time. He was homeless. He was unmarried, 30-something rabbi. He recruited a bunch of young men, uneducated boys, some of them still in their teens, to hit the road with him. He fraternized with prostitutes, extortionists, collaborators, zealots, and other people who were considered lowlifes, riffraff, sinners. He was criticized a lot because he did this. He was criticized because he was not normal, because he didn't fit the mold, and he didn't care. He did not care what people thought of him. He had a mission to accomplish, and he did that, and he told the truth. He did call himself a rabbi, but instead of saying the normal kinds of rabbinic teachings, he told stories about people that they could relate to, about farmers and business managers, disrespectful sons, uh, to describe the kingdom of heaven. He talks about nature, seeds, mustard seeds, um, a pearl, a banquet. This was so radically different than what the other rabbis were talking about. Jesus was weird. He was a weirdo. He was such a weirdo that uh, people hated him for it. And that's been one of the interesting things I have seen from some of my videos in the comments, that it seems like a lot of people are just have these knee-jerk reactions against people who are weird. They don't like people who are weird. They don't fit the mold. My question is, if Jesus walked in right now, what would we think about him? Would we think, would we embrace him immediately? Would we recognize that he's the Messiah? 
Or would we do the same thing that, that a lot of the Jews did, most of the Jews did? Would we miss who he is because he's weird, because he doesn't fit the mold? Because of how radical and how strange and how counterculture, cultural Jesus was, it's, it's so weird to me, so illogical to me that, that people, that a lot of Christians can assume that we who are supposed to be Christ-like, we're the body of Christ. One of the main things we're supposed to do is to imitate Christ. He was our example. And yet so many Christians seem to think that we're all supposed to fit some little mold. We're all supposed to look some certain way, fit into this normal Christian uh, mold character, look a certain way, think a certain way, act a certain way, wear a certain kind of clothing, have a some certain kind of hairstyles go to certain kinds of churches, listen to a certain kind of music. Um, who made those rules? Is that in the Bible? I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. I see this countercultural, radical guy who turned the world upside down. That's what I see. Um, Jesus and God are so much bigger than us. He, he says our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts because our minds are so small, our human minds or we see things now through a mirror darkly. Someday we'll understand. Someday we will understand all truth. Um, when we are given our glorified bodies and when we leave these, these, these shells and we are, are with God and Jesus in heaven, at that time we will understand all things. We will be like the angels, it says in the Bible. Um, so then we will understand. But now Paul tells us during this time, we see things as though through a mirror darkly. So we can understand some things, what God allows us to understand, what the Holy Spirit opens up our minds and teaches us to understand. But we cannot ever completely understand God, understand our creator, understand this God of the universe who is big enough to create everything just by speaking it into existence. It boggles my mind that anyone can think that they have God all figured out. They have everything all figured out. And they, they know God always does this or God never would do this. How can anyone say that? That is the epitome of arrogance that any human being would think that they have so figured out this God of the universe that they know what God would always do or what God would never do. How can anybody say that? God is always doing surprising, crazy, weird things. It's all through the Bible. God does new things. God continues to create. We should never be satisfied with getting into a rut in our Christianity because we can never reach the end of God. God is so marvelous and so huge and so complex and wonderful that we can never get to the end of him. Even if we spent every day, all day long, reading our Bible, spending time in prayer, speaking in tongues, seeking God in every way that we can, we still would never get to the bottom of God. He's, he's endless. He's infinite. So that should... That should spur us on to, to want to spend more time with him, to never be satisfied with where we are right now. Because we can always get deeper. We can always grow closer to him. We can always keep moving into closer to his heart, journeying closer into his, his love for us and, and his compassion and his grace and his mercy and all the wonderful things about him. Jesus' contemporaries, the people, the Jews that he came to, the Pharisees were experts in the law. So they knew the Old Testament. They knew all the prophecies that were prophesying Jesus. Even in that culture, even your regular people, they were very familiar with the scriptures, with the Old Testament, which is the scriptures that they had at that time. Uh, and I would dare say that they were way more familiar. Your average person was way more familiar with their scriptures than most Christians are familiar with, with our Bible today. And yet they still missed him. They completely missed him. Jesus's arrival fulfilled hundreds of scriptures, hundreds of prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament. The, the chances of that are impossible. When you go through and you look at all the, the, the details in the Old Testament, that, that were fulfilled by all of the circumstances of Jesus coming, things that he couldn't even have had anything to do with or make happen, like where he was born and where his mother came from, where his father came, his lineage. All of these things are not things that he could have, oh, he knew the scripture, so he could have kind of arranged them himself. He couldn't have done that. It's, it is impossible. 
unless he is actually the son of God and who he is. All of those scriptures that were the prophecies that were fulfilled when Jesus came were completely, completely impossible to do unless by miracles, by a miracle. And yet these people who knew these prophecies inside and out, they memorized it, they knew it, and they still missed him. So my question is, what would we think about Jesus if he walked in the door right now? Would you recognize him? Are we any smarter? Are we better able, more discerning than the Israelites, the the Pharisees were? Probably not. We don't even know our scriptures as well as they knew theirs. So I'm not saying this to to call down judgment on anybody. I'm saying this as a as a, a request, a plea for us to 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 give grace to these weird people in our midst. So I've always been a weird person. Um, I I grew up weird. <laughs> I'm one of those. I'm an artist. I'm an artist. I'm a musician, and I've always been that way. I've always. I've always marched to my own drummer, they say. So people didn't understand me. I was always um, not a very popular kid. We moved every single year. I went to a different school most of my life, and I was very shy, so I didn't make friends. I For years, I didn't have any friends when I was growing up. I had a a pretty (laughs) sad childhood. (laughs) But, uh, But anyway, I think I turned out okay. So I know what it's like to be weird. I know what it's like to be some of the the riffraff, these people that Jesus hung out with, the the lowest, the lowliest people that that everyone looked down on. Um, And Jesus loved them. They were the people who who surrounded him the most. And he loved them and he treated them with respect. And they're weirdos. Have you ever hung out with homeless people? I have. I have actually experienced homelessness before. Homeless people are some of the weirdest people you might ever meet. Even today, I uh, try to be very aware of um, seeing people like homeless people on the streets. And um, I have this thing that I do. If I have any cash in on me, then I will jump out and I will give them whatever I have. And a lot of times I'll, I'll pray with them. Um, and I've done that over and over many, many, many times. So, But a lot of these people, they have mental illness, a lot of them. Um, I try to listen to them for as much time as I have just to, to let them feel like they are... They are loved and they are, they are respected. You know, these are people that, that nobody listens to them. They treat them like garbage. They're used to being just treated like garbage. Um, and so I try just in, in a few minutes to listen to them, ask them if I can pray for something. They almost always say yes. But then sometimes they just, if somebody, if there's somebody who has mental illness, they'll just go on talking and talking and don't make any sense at all. Jesus loved those people, the lepers, the lepers, the people that had to go live outside of, of town and be all by themselves. They couldn't be associate with regular people. If they did go around other people, they had to yell out that they, they had to proclaim, I'm a leper, I'm, I'm unclean, unclean. So even just in the laws, they had to separate themselves and they had to announce that to everyone, you know, how terrible they were. I'm untouchable. I'm untouchable. Jesus hugged them. He touched them. He healed them. Is that how we are? Do we feel that way about the untouchables in our society, about the unlovable, the weirdos in our society? I'm going to finish with this interesting quote. So as I was reading, I have been quoting from these two really interesting articles I found online. I'm going to link to them underneath here. So if you're interested in reading them, I want to give credit where credit is due. Years ago, a publisher asked the gothic rock singer-songwriter Nick Cave. Um, So if you're not familiar with Nick Cave... Oh, this guy is the weirdest of the weird. <laughs> so he's a, a gothic rock singer songwriter, and he is just weird, 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 weird. Uh, anyway, so I'm not exactly certain of all of the um, how this all came about, but he was asked by a publisher to write an introduction to Mark's gospel. I don't know the gothic rock Bible. I don't know, but anyway. So at first, Cave was uncertain, recalling Jesus as the. This is how he thought of Jesus. At the time, the decaf of worship he heard about in his childhood Anglican church. So he grew up Anglican. So he knew about Jesus. I don't, I'm assuming he's Christian. He doesn't, I don't know. But anyway, and um, he agreed to do this. And so he read the gospel of Mark in preparation for writing this introduction. To his surprise, the Jesus he discovered in Mark's gospel wasn't a wishy-washy Christ. He was a wild Messiah. And here's a quote from Nick Cave. The Christ that emerges from Mark, tramping through the haphazard events of his life, had a ringing intensity about him that I could not resist. 
The Christ that the church offers us, the bloodless, placid Savior, the man smiling benignly at a group of children, or calmly hanging from the cross, denies Christ his potent, creative sorrow or his boiling anger that confronts us so forcefully in Mark. This denies Christ his humanity, offering up a figure that we can perhaps praise but never relate to. If the renewal of the mind by the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the gospel and shapes us to become more like Jesus, then it follows that we too should become more weird the more Christ-like we become. Merely to praise Christ in his perfect perfectness keeps us on our knees with our heads pitifully bent. Christ came as a liberator. Christ understood that we as humans were forever held to the ground by the pull of gravity, our ordinariness, our mediocrity, and it was through his example that he gave our imaginations the freedom to rise and to fly. In short, to be Christ-like. Amen. Nick Cave. I like it. I like it. Jesus was radical. Jesus was countercultural. Jesus was weird. And I don't think that most people would recognize him if he walked in. I don't know if I would recognize him if he walked in because you know what? Nobody has it correct. I still sit on here and I spout all this stuff about my opinions and, and things, conclusions I've come to from studying the Bible and from my relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and teachings. But I still have a lot of things wrong. A lot of things wrong. We all do. Every one of us sees through a mirror darkly. Nobody has the 100% truth of God. Not in this life. None of us. Not Billy Graham. Not anybody. Not even probably Paul who wrote a lot of the, the New Testament. But everything he wrote in the New Testament was inspired by God. And it is part of our scriptures. And it is it can be considered infallible. But he, as a person, Paul as a person, Peter as a person, the disciples, Mary the mother of God, they were all humans. And they were all imperfect human beings. None of us are sinless. None of us are perfect. None of us understands completely. There was one, one human being who ever lived on this earth who could say these things, claim these things about himself. That he was perfect and that he was sinless. That was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. And so that's why I believe. When Jesus said the, the path is narrow, I think he was talking about one thing. And that was his own blood. His own flesh and blood. He is the only human being who can claim to have been perfect. So he is the only one who can offer us salvation. So the one, one narrow point in this world, in truth, as I believe it, is the blood of Jesus Christ, okay? It's like the center of the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ. But then on either side of it, so you've got everything before Jesus, and then you go through that one little narrow, narrow doorway, believing in the blood of Jesus. And then once you get on the other side of that, it's huge. God is so big. There is no limit to God. Why would he limit us? Why would he expect us to be these carbon copy cookie cutter people and then after you get saved then you have to go to this church and you have to wear these clothes and you have to look like this and wear your hair like this and can't listen to this kind of music you can't drink alcohol anymore and you can't ever say these words and you know no no it's not about that being a christian following jesus christ is an adventure it's a wild ride there's power there with the holy spirit inside of you Holy Spirit, God who created the whole universe lives inside of us. If you believe in Jesus Christ, that's what Jesus tells us. That's what Paul tells us in the Bible. That we are sealed with the Holy Spirit once we accept Jesus Christ in his blood. So that is a wild ride, wild ride. Believe me, Jesus wasn't boring and he does not want us to be boring. That is not how this works. I'm going to end this podcast with a little message to all my weirdos out there, all my fellow weirdos, <laughs> nerds, dorks, people who don't fit the mold, creatives, artists, musicians, poets. I know who you are. <laughs> we have a high calling. You probably, I'm going to tell you something. You probably had a similar experience growing up as I did. You didn't fit the mold. You were weird. You didn't fit in. People probably made fun of you. Maybe people in your family didn't understand you. Maybe you weren't popular. 
You have been given a high calling. You are a creator. You know who else is a creator? God. God created everything. And he has made you a creator as well. So we are made in the image of Christ. And there is no better gifting than to also be a creator, to be someone who creates art and beauty and um, music. It's, what, it's a wonderful thing. So believe in that. Have faith that what God is calling you to do is something beautiful and something wonderful and something important. And if the world has beaten you down as it did to me for so many years, I struggled with suicidal depression and, and actually even attempted suicide at one point in my life because I was so depressed because I didn't fit in and I didn't have any friends and nobody understood me because God understands you. God created you with one of the highest callings possible to be a fellow creator with him. So believe, believe that what he is calling you to do is beautiful, is wonderful. It is wonderful. So dive deeply into him because this, this life can be such an adventure with the Holy Spirit inside of you. And if, if you are able to tap into that, the Holy Spirit, Jesus inside of you and let your creativity flow in that way, oh my gosh, there's no end to it. There's no end to it. You know, God, God gives lots of people visions, not just me, lots of people. Maybe he's going to give you visions, dreams. Uh, he's going to let you see into the other side of that veil and experience beautiful, amazing, magical things. There is no limit. There's no limit to God. And so right now I'm going to, I am going to end with just a little quick prayer. And my prayer is for creatives. It's for the other, the other weirdos out there, anybody watching this who can identify with the things I'm saying right now, I'm just praying for you. In the name of Jesus, I just lift all of these people, my fellow weirdos, up to Jesus. And we just thank you, Lord. You are our fellow weirdo. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you created us in this beautiful, crazy, wonderful way, Lord God. And we celebrate that. You celebrate us because we are your children. And you love us so much. You gave your life for us. And you want, you desire a relationship with us. You want to spend time with us. You want us to spend eternity with you, Lord Jesus. And so we just celebrate you for that. And thank you. Thank you for making us all unique and wonderful, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We worship your holy name, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord, for everybody watching this, Lord, anybody who might struggle with depression or might feel um, like they have no place, like they are not accepted or nobody understands them, Lord, I just pray for, for those people right now that they would get your vision that they would understand how much you love them, how much you celebrate them, Lord Jesus, and how you have created them exactly as you want them to be, Lord God. And that there is so much wonder and joy and happiness and amazingness within your heart. And I pray they would get a vision for that and they would seek you harder than they ever have before. And they would get freedom, freedom from depression, freedom from, um, from low self-esteem, freedom from... Uh, lack of from not loving themselves Lord Jesus because you love them and I thank you Lord Jesus for your perfect perfect will and your perfect plan for every single one of us Lord in your holy name I pray Jesus amen so at the very beginning of this podcast I showed some quick clips of some modern day weirdos for Jesus Kat Kerr Robin Bullock Catherine Coleman Benny Hinn is it okay to be a weirdo for Jesus my answer is yes and according to Nick Cave, the closer you get to Jesus Christ, the weirder you're probably going to become. I think that's true. What do you think? See you next time. Hey, thanks for watching Join Hands with Heaven. I'm Blue. If you don't mind, please like and share this video. Please subscribe and hit that little bell icon so you'll be the first to know when the next video comes out. See you next time.